Hello, welcome to another episode of Rustation Station. I'm your host, Alan Wyma. Today, I have Serge, who is the creator of a library called, is it Asynchronox? Is that right? I said Asynchronix, but that's probably another of my French accent thing. <laughs> yeah, Asynchronix. Either way, it's good. Sorry, sorry, Asynchronix. You know, I tried to look it up before the show, and I did spell it Asynchronox which I'm not too sure why I have an ox at the end, but it's asynchronix. Yes, that's right. Well, I mean, first of all, if you're listening to you, you created the library, isn't this right? Yes, I did. Yeah, so then whatever you say is correct is correct. You know, the, the way English works is you can spell it one way and say it another way. And a lot of times the other way is usually a French word. So it's just said totally different than typical English words. So you would... Oh, know you know, me. I'm so used to having people mispronounce my name that I have absolutely no problem with people mispronouncing my project. No worry. <laughs> yeah, it was a very interesting project, right? I think one of the parts that stood out to me was the amount of uh, how big the README is and how detailed it is, is pretty astounding for such a beginning project, right? I'm kind of curious, like what made you decide to document so nicely for the README? Because that's usually something you do later rather than so early in a project. Well, I mean, first, I guess that from the surface documentation, the project doesn't look that large. But if you look in, in details, there are actually many layers that you don't see. So the, it's actually a pretty big project on which I had been working for more than a year. Inside, you will have, in fact, a totally custom uh, executor with its own uh, task system. You will have custom channel, BSC channel. So, you know, I thought, okay, I made all of this. Let's do it right. Let's have the documentation as well at the same level. There was a lot of effort there that you, you cannot see, like lots of testing as well made with uh, Miri, te various tests for yeah, synchronization. It was a lot of work in, in general. So yeah, documentation in the end was the easy part. Yeah, usually documentation is the hardest part, right? Because I think most of us are afraid to document because we're like, oh, it's always going to be changing. We're always going to be adding, removing features. Documentation should happen later when we're, you know, ready for when we have a following, etc. But you can put that at the forefront, right? Yeah, I must admit it's kind of a pleasure even to write documentation in Rust because it's really a light process. I mean, just having the markdown, you know, writing it in a way that is very natural for me compared to the experiences I had before with other languages. I really like writing a Rust documentation actually, so I don't consider it a bother. And as being a Frenchman, right? I don't know. Most French people that I talk to, they usually they ask me to review their English. Although their English is, is quite good, but yeah. Do you find it difficult to write the documentation in English? Because I find a lot of French people, I mean, it, the grammar is quite difficult, right? In English. And sometimes, you know, it takes time to this all out. It sounds like you've been using English for a long time, so maybe you may not have this problem. You know, <laughs> I have to be honest, it takes a bit of effort, and I'm pretty sure the result is is not perfect, probably still far from it. But yeah, you're right. I've made most of my career in the aerospace industry and before that as a scientist. So I'm used to writing English, but it still takes some effort. If you're a scientist, don't you usually have better Latin rather than better English, I would say? Or is it only for doctors? Oh uh, yeah, probably only doctors. <laughs> I mean, I'm a doctor <laughs> technically, but <laughs> yeah. not in that field. <laughs> No, okay. we don't use Latin. I don't yeah. know any Latin, to be honest. Well, I mean, aeroplane, right? I believe that's Latin. You know, a lot of these words in English are Latin-based, right? Oh, right. I see where you're coming from. Yeah. No, no. English is definitely the lingua franca in, in the field. Oh, now you just use French with me. Isn't that lingua franca? Isn't that a French word? Or is that uh, Latin? That time might have been Latin, actually. I think that was Latin. <laughs> <laughs> So you made your point. <laughs> you know more Latin than you think, I believe. Yeah, but how do I say? Okay, let's kind of get back to asynchronous. Actually, you know what? Why don't we kind of talk a little bit about your background because you did hint at it. You said you were in the aerospace industry before? Yeah, I've always been in some ways connected to the aerospace industries. I started as a scientist in also in connection with that industry, but that was actually by accident. I moved from my home country to Poland and being a scientist was at that time, given the, the industrial development of the space industry, specifically in Poland, was the only way to keep a connection to that. So I have been a scientist for 
I don't know, I guess it was like 10, 15 years working on uh, space propulsion. So uh, more specifically on uh, plasma propulsion, which is something you may know under, you know, ion propulsion, something like this. So basically thrusters which are used on spacecraft to, uh, and that use the, uh, the onboard energy to propel the, uh, the spacecraft. And yeah, afterwards I moved. I was a consultant as well in that industry for a few years. I worked on some projects. Probably the most fancy one was what I called the, the space vacuum cleaner. It was European Space Agency project to collect rest particles in orbit and accelerate them so that you don't need to take propellant. So that would enable very low orbit missions, you know, because when you are in low orbit, you have a lot of drag and you will never get enough propellant to compensate for all that drag. But it was an interesting project. And then afterwards, I really jumped to the industry as in a subsidiary of uh, Airbus, where I worked for quite a few years. And this is where actually I started to work on simulation, spacecraft simulation. Even in that industry, it's relatively new. It's something that they've been doing for, I'd say, 15 years. But it has become really essential. So what they do at the early stage of the project, they need to verify that all the onboard computer, which is basically the, the central computer on a spacecraft, uh, that any command it issues, any telemetry it receives and so on, everything plays well with the other equipment. And in the early stage, you don't have any of that equipment. All the subsystems of the satellites don't exist yet. Usually, these are custom developed equipment. So what they do, they make simula numerical simulation of each of them. So simulation, you know, we are talking about at a functional level, which means, you know, it will reproduce the data that you will send on a bus inside the satellites. You usually have several data buses mail bus, space wire, things like this. So you need to model how these frames will be exchanged, at which moment, based on which event, external event, some measurements, some sensor, and so on. This is how it's done. And then as the project progresses, you will get your hand on actual equipment, and then you do what's called the hardware-in-the-loop simulation or hybrid simulation where you still have your whole simulation bench with the different subsystems simulated, but some of them will be replaced by actual hardware and will communicate with the simulation using electric racks, which make the conversions. So they convert your virtual bench, the, the data that is sent, etc., into actual signals that are sent or received from the real equipment. At this time, of the project, everything works in real time. So you need to have very little lag. You need to run exactly with the same uh, clock as the world clock. Earlier in the project, you don't care about that. You want actually to your simulator to run as fast as possible. So the time is totally simulated. As soon as you have finished a stage of simulation, you increment to the next simulated time where something is going to happen and you continue in this way. So you will actually typically run much faster than in reality at that point. Now, when you're saying simulations, right, what kind of things, I mean, you're talking about simulating like a whole airplane that's flying and then different kinds of weather that may be happening or what? I'm just trying to understand what the simulations are doing. First, I'll be honest. I know little body about space aerocraft so i will speak about spacecraft which is the thing that i know best i don't exactly know how airplanes are designed i know that they use a similar methodology on a spacecraft you know you have different things like a reaction wheel for instance a reaction wheel is it's kind of a gyroscope which is working the other way so instead of measuring your orientation you actually spin a wheel to get the spacecraft with the orientation that you want Usually you have several such spin wheels on a satellite oriented in three different directions. So this is one example. In that case, you will model how the speed of the wheel, depending on the voltage that it gets. You will also have an encoder which will read the speed position possibly. And then all of this will communicate with other models, those which, for instance, deliver. So the power supply, for instance, which delivers the voltage to the reaction wheel. 
it will communicate with another model that is an environment model. So this is not a real thing that's on the spacecraft, but is something that models what's outside, like, you know, the dynamics of the spacecraft. So this is another type of uh, model that will tell you, yeah, if I spin the wheel at this moment for this much, the spacecraft will rotate in this way. If I thrust, so if I put my propulsion module on, I will change the orbit in such and such way. So this is a dynamics model. You have other models for yeah all the power supplies on the spacecraft. You have for gyroscopes, you have a model for ever, the, the transponders. So um, what will basically carry all the information you want to send and receive from Earth, between satellite and Earth. Yeah, these are the kind of things that are modeled in a satellite. In the end, you end up with very many actually models in order of hundreds because, you know, every single thing like a switch will be modeled. And all these things are connected afterwards on the large bench. So this is also another big part of the job. So these simulators, yeah, they are used in, in such a way. The thing is that industry, uh, the, those simulators are usually developed in-house. Uh, you just have a few companies that can afford to make real good ones. And uh, those are still, because usually most of them were developed like 15, 10 years ago, so they were written in C++. Usually they were single-threaded. So this is a little bit how the idea for uh, asynchronics came up, to have something different. Yes, uh, more performance, exploit uh, Rust async, to be able to parallelize automatically all computations. And using Rust, which I'm convinced is definitely something that will get uh, broad adoption in that industry, but in others, like in automotive, yeah, that's interesting. I know that they're trying to bring it in, but you need to do a lot of preparation work, like it proofs and things like that, if I remember correctly. So yeah, that's the thing that to bring Rust to mission critical, safety critical projects, you normally need to have a certified tool chain. So this is something that the people at Ferris Systems? Uh, yeah, Ferris Systems are working on. So, but here is the good thing. When you make a simulator, you don't actually need that. This is why, you know, I think it's a kind of a gateway, a way to get the first experience in those industries. Simulators are not constrained by the necessity to have a certified compiler. Those companies usually use off-the-shelf compilers like GCC or whatever. You don't need any of that. It's not considered, since it's not software that will fly, or in the case of automotive software that will be inside a car, it does not need actually to adhere to those strict guidelines. So it's a much lighter process to develop a simulation. And yeah, that's why I see it as well. And there was a lot of interest in the European Space Agency for having such a project that not only brings value right away, proposing a new approach to simulation, but could also get you know our feet wet with this new fantastic <laughs> language that is Rust. That's quite interesting. Are you still consulting in the space industry? Not so much. Now, actually, Asynchronix is part of, um, of a business endeavor that I started. Uh, I created a company that's called Asynchronix with CS. And uh, the idea is uh, to have this platform, uh, Asynchronix, that's open source to let basically everyone that has it's not only for spacecraft. I'm thinking about anything that is a cyber physical system. So that is composed of many such bricks, each brick being something that you can model and that communicate with others on what data bus you have on the network. So that's a little bit the idea. So Asynchronix is a for-profit company, Asynchronix CS, and Asynchronix IX is the open source uh, part of it. So yeah, I'm still in a sense, in, in the aerospace industry, in a business, but in a different form. Okay, I see. So that's why it's very, because you, obviously you, you come from the space industry, so you're more into the space simulations. That's why I said it wasn't quite clear exactly what kind of simulations. Like you said, it's supposed to be generic, right? So you can add it to different kinds of simulations, right? Yeah, there's nothing really specific to aerospace in asynchronix ix <laughs> in the end when you look it's just an actor model behind us what you have each model is actually an actor 
it communicates with other models using a queue, a thread safe uh, queue. And that's all there is to it. The only thing that's a little bit opinionate about this is the fact that you will connect the models from outside. Whereas usually when you use the actor model, very often an actor will spawn another model. And this is usually the, the way the, the whole system will be built. Here, you build the system from uh, different bricks, you connect them. So this is the assembly pro process. And most of the time, this connection between these different actors will not change. That reflects the fact that in a cyber physical system, you know, you just have physical systems that are connected with wires between one another. So that's a fixed uh, network. Yeah. Yeah. I saw you have a couple of examples, right? You have espresso, power supply, stock <laughs> yeah. motor. I mean, first of all, I have to say the model for your espresso, like you have, sorry, not the model necessarily, but the diagram that you created in ASCII art looks really nice. Oh, thank you. <laughs> did that by hand or did you use a program to create that? I think I started with some online thing to create this, but then afterwards I saw it's just faster to tweak it by hand. So I ended up doing most of this by hand. I figured that you probably did it that way because it's just easier to just copy and paste and then just slowly change it. When you took it by hand, does that take some time? Because I mean, you have to connect all those lines in the diagram to different places and everything else. You know, the really nice thing about VS Code, it makes it easy to edit uh, several uh, lines at once. And that actually makes the process very really easy. No, no, it wasn't very really difficult. So in this one, right, so you have the model. So you, okay, you, I see just going from top to bottom, right, you have a water pump that you have there for the espresso. You implement model for pump, but there's no functions that are implemented. So for a model, you don't have to implement something in order to actually use it? No. Well, it depends what you mean. The only thing that people are usually interested in is the, the timeline. What will happen at which moment? And then you monitor the simulation and see that everything uh, goes according to the plan. So here it's a rather simple thing, even though you will already see that, for instance, at some moment in the espresso example, if you make too many shots, the thing will stop working. That's because there's no more water in the tank. Yes? That's a very simple example, but transcribes quite well to what you will see in a cyber physical systems. All those systems, they communicate between one another, but they don't know much about one another. So, you know, the behavior of the whole system becomes relatively unpredictable when you start to, to add many of them. And this is the point here, to see if this, all these systems play well together, if they reproduce what you want. On a spacecraft, what you will want is that the central computer, the onboard computer, is prepared to react for each such situation. So yeah, it doesn't need to make you coffee, actually. <laughs> okay. And for this espresso machine, I'm just reading through the main function. What are you exactly trying to simulate here and to try to test? Is it about the amount of water or amount of pumps of water? I'm trying to take a look at this. I see it talked about flow rate, right? Yeah. So here, it's a relatively simple example. You have a pump. When you know your pump is working, it sucks water in and from the tank. So one of the output of that pump is the mass flow rate that it's going to the pump. And that goes to the water tank model because the water tank model knows, all right, my level of water is going down according to that mass flow rate. And it calculates basically the next event in that case. So it's an event-driven model, yes, an event-driven system. So right away, the tank knows at what time it will be depleted if it goes on with the same mass flow rate for some time. And it registered an event at a later time when it is expected to be empty. The pump may stop working before it happens. Usually that's what will happen. So then that event is canceled. We know that there is still water in the tank. We just recalculate it in this case. Yeah, this is how it works. This is all basically time. It's a time-based simulation. You create an event at a given time. That event may affect other systems. All of them will make their own computation. What's going on at this simulated time? Yeah, at T0 plus three seconds, I start pulling a shot. Well, that will affect the pump. The pump will have to say, tell to the tank, there's some non-zero mass flow rate here. If you have a more complex system, it will tell the, the power supply, I'm taking energy here. 
etc., etc. All these models are making a computation. It was a bit specific and compares to a normal, um, to say, w- server, for instance, where you would use the actor model. Is that here? It's an async computation. And the end of it will be when nobody has anything to do anymore. So that's the unusual part. And this is why the executor is a custom one, because Tokyo is not is obviously an excellent executor. And I admit, we stole many ideas from Tokyo. We improved even on a few things. But uh, the thing that is not made for is deadlocks. And what we have here is a deadlock. When everything is finished on given time, so at T0 plus 3 seconds, all the models have made what they wanted, but then it's over. What happens is that all the queues are empty. There's no more incoming message to process. And the executor like Tokyo, that's a deadlock, which is not a normal condition. I mean, there is deadlock detection in Tokyo and so on. It's not made for this. Here, it's a normal event. At every step, at some point, you will get to a situation where everything is done. And then you need to tell the main thread, okay, we are done. Please go to the next time step. That's how it works, yeah. I see. So in your espresso one, right, are you trying to figure out like, okay, in certain events, certain scenarios, will I deplete water faster than normal or even slower? Will this be a use case? Exactly, yes, in that simple example. So that's what happened. You pull some shots, you have the possibility to cancel the shot, you have the possibility to program how long it will take. Depending on all these actions that you will do, so pressing the button, cancelling maybe earlier and so on, the water in the tank will deplete faster or slower. At some point, you won't be able to pull a shot anymore, at which point you can refill the tank, an arbitrary amount of uh, water, and then the thing goes on, you are again able to press the button, pull a shot, and so on. So yeah, this is exactly the kind of behavior that you want to reproduce. Obviously, it's, it's a very simple example. When you have a complex system, it, it becomes accordingly more complex. Yeah, I'm just trying to think about what kinds of practical use cases would this be for? I mean, obviously, in this, when we're talking about this scenario, it's such a simple scenario, like you said, that it's hard to envision the power and really the, the practicality of this kind of system. Well, what can Asynchronix or Synchronix do at the moment? Like, what would be a good use case that this would be really useful? Yeah, basically everything that we call a cyber physical system. So that could be a car simply, yes. Nowadays, a car is actually a cyber physical system. It's We all know how repairing a car in your garage nowadays is impossible. That's because, you know, it contains so much electronic, so many subsystems that are not digital subsystems. I mean, they may have an analog part, which is measuring something. But in the end, a car is a big collection of, you know, it can be up to 100 what they call ECUs, which are basically embedded systems. Each of these, not each, but most of these are complex systems that have their own microcontroller. So basically, they are, each of them is a computer. And to simulate the whole behavior of these things, which must act together, you know, the acceleration, braking. Now, if you speak about electric cars, you have even more coordination to electric vehicles, you have more coordination to do. So this is something that we will see in more and more systems. So I think that's why it was interesting for me because I had this reflection that we've been designing uh, satellites for like 15 years. I mean, using this process of simulation to design satellites for 15 years. But in the end, when you look, the way satellites are built or have been built for many years now is just the same as many other things. So a large drone will be the same. It will have several pieces. Each of them is actually contains a microcontroller or an FPGA, which means it has a complex uh, state machine. It will have different states uh, with different substates, which will change depending on a number of different conditions. And basically checking that all these parts play well together, it does take a simulator. It's impossible to do by hand to evaluate all the scenarios. Now, it's even more true if you get AI into the thing, because when you have, you know, like self-driving capabilities, then basically the parametric space that you must explore to test your system, and you want to test it preferably not with someone inside, this parametric space is enormous. So simulation here is really a big asset. You can simulate conditions on the road, say, yeah, at this moment, this happens on the road, it's turning this way. 
we have detected an obstacle or something like this, will all the system respond adequately to the situation with the right timing constraints in the right order, et cetera? Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. I like the idea that you're talking about, like inside the car, you have kind of a bunch of subsystems, right? So can you actually create something so complicated with using this asynchronous? Yeah, that's the idea because, you know, what you have inside cars is not, I mean, the idea is very similar to what you have on a spacecraft. Nowadays, that's it. It's on the cars, the simply what makes the situation different. It's not that the systems on a car are less or more complicated than on the spacecraft. They, they are very similar. Of course, I mean, everybody loves that the spacecraft industry is always <laughs> very late, uses old chips and so on, which is true because it has different constraints. But in general, it's very much the same. What makes simulation interesting on spacecraft, though, is not exactly the same reason that makes it interesting on cars. So on a spacecraft, the big problem is you cannot service the thing once you've launched it. It's almost impossible. Then you have different mitigation measures. You can cut off some systems, try to make systems work a little bit in a different way and so on. But your maneuver is really reduced. In a car, the problem is different you have someone on board and you may, may be easier to service, but the problem is that if there's a fault, is there something going wrong, it will be a big problem. And the industry has known such problems such as, you know, accelerators that got stuck because of, of an embedded system. It was not physically stuck. Simply the car keeps on accelerating and so on. So these are things that are really dangerous, directly connected to the fact that you have electronics inside with a very complex behavior, very complex emergent behavior as well. Okay. Building that custom executor, right? Have you actually released that so that people can also use that or it's only within the asynchronous project? First thing to say is it might be of limited use as a standalone executor for the reason that there is no reactor. It's a bit different. Yeah, Tokyo has this reactor because usually people are interested in what's happening when I get something from the database, some file or something, this thing is ready. There's no such concept in the simulator. We just need the executor. And on the other hand, we need basically what's a priority queue for time-based events. So when the executor is done, when you reach the deadlock, basically, you know, at this point, it's over. There's no waiting for an event. Nothing will happen until the main thread, ta uh, thread takes over. Look in the priority queue, what are the next events chronologically? inject those events. So that's a bit different. The executor part is very much like uh, Tokyo. It uses a similar architecture, but there's no reactor. That being said, so back to your question, there are cargo features that uh, you can enable to use the uh, executor as such. And I actually use it on, it's a GitHub project, which I call the uh, Takio Bench. Why like that? Because uh, the queue that I use in asynchronics, it's called Tachyonix. I mean, or at least it's based on it. Tachyonix is something that I released as a standalone MPSC uh, async queue. And I wanted to benchmark not only the queue, but also the executor. So Tachyo Bench is not released as a crate because it's not really interesting as a crate, but it shows how you can use the executor if you don't need the reactor. And it compares the executor from asynchronics it compare with Tokyo, with small. I have, I think, yeah, another one. Oh, small scale. Yeah, that's another executor that's actually not based on small, or perhaps it used to be, but is exploring ideas that are a bit similar to those which I put in asynchronous. So it compares all these executors and many different queues as well, different async queues. So you can use it standalone, but I'd say the interest is limited unless for some reason you don't need a reactor. Yeah, I was just curious if anybody else would be interested in something like that and if you separate it out. But I did see it's within your project by itself, right? Yeah, I mean, I think there are ideas to take from asynchronics. I had some exchanges as well with the developer, main developer of a small scale because, yeah, we have similar interests even though he's developing his executor for a completely different use case. But we did have a similar reflections on why Tokyo is better than small, uh, for instance. 
what we can do to make it better and so on. It was actually when I started, I wanted to use small because small is very, what call it, didactic. You can learn easily. I mean, Stepan always made a great job of, uh, you know, not only programming things that work and that have good performance and so on, but also of um, writing it in a way that makes it uh, easily understood. Tokyo is a much larger beast. It's a very large code base. It took me a lot of time to understand. I won't say all because it's far from all, but uh, let's say the crucial points of Tokyo. But in the end, yeah, I came to the conclusion that the Tokyo approach was, in our case, uh, where message passing is basically the bottleneck, was much better. So this is Mm. most of Asynchronix is based on the same approach. Okay. I like how you have the examples and makes things pretty easy to understand. And actually, it's not so big, but I'm sure it must have taken you some time. How long have you been working on Asynchronix? I worked for more than a year. It's, as you say, I mean, there are actually more crates than Asynchronix. I released some very small one like Recycle Box, which I use. A recycle box is basically a box which reuses its allocated memory, if possible, and otherwise allocates a larger segment if necessary. So this is very useful when you have futures, which very often have the same, you are very often allocating the futures of the same size. So it's very useful. Tokyo has something a bit similar, but which doesn't allow growing the size of the box. I released other crates like ST3 was actually surprised because it's another one that, you know, all these crates, I never advertised them. The only one that I had slightly advertised was Tachyonix, and that was later, so the, the channel. But ST3 is um, two queues, actually, work still in queues. One is a FIFO, the other one is a LIFO queue, which is the one I started with. The FIFO queue is actually almost the same as Tokyo. It's just a bit nicer API. And I see that people have been using this crate a lot, even though, as I say, for the FIFO, I don't take much credit. This is very much the queue from Tokyo. Even though I did spot an issue in the Tokyo queue and I made, actually made a patch to the Tokyo queue itself, which I, some about an issue that I discovered while uh, making ST3. The LIFO queue, it's interesting because I was convinced at the beginning that having LIFO queue would be better. You know, usually people say having LIFO ordering is better for latency, for cache usage as well, because usually you are reusing what's the last element that was put in. So it's good. It's still in the cache. But the thing that I discovered after working a lot on developing this life queue, because this is relatively, it's small, but testing it thoroughly is very time consuming. Then I discovered that the five for queue that Tokyo was using was actually better. So I added this to ST3 and this is what I'm using now. Okay. Um, yeah. So I, all this goes to say, yeah, there are a few other crates like that, so like uh, Tachyonix and so on. It goes to say that in the end, the, it is not a huge code base, but it's still quite, uh, I, I think I counted overall, it's about uh, 10K when you count the other crates, which I created for that, it's about 10K lines. But it's mostly tricky code because, yeah, this is async task system, so all of that is multi-threaded code, It's which makes it yeah very tricky to test. There's a, obviously quite a lot of unsafe, not that I want to, but if you want to have high performance uh, similar to what Tokyo achieves, there's really no way around it. Now, it's not just you working on this, right? I think I heard you say you have at least one other person. Is that true? I have another, yeah. I have an associate, but on the code itself, it has been mostly me up to now. My associate is more for other aspects of the, uh, the development of the business. Now, for the business, right, can we talk about, like, what is it that you guys are trying to to do? Are you trying to provide consulting services and use this as a tool to kind of let people know who you are? How does everything kind of fit together? Now, well, services in a limited way. Yes, we want to provide services for model development. That's one thing, and that's something that we have a lot of experience, both of us, a lot of experience with it because we've been doing that for spacecraft for, for many years. But that's, I would say just a part of the business. What two other things that I would like is one is to be able to create, you know, an ecosystem of models. And I think this is the powerful idea because 
as we enter a world where you know all these systems that are around us are actually made from smaller subsystems that are usually have a controller on FPGA, it becomes very difficult to describe the behavior of those systems with a data sheet. And this is what we do. Yeah, it's still the same. Usually the systems are described by data sheets. The space industry is no exception to this. And making models actually make you aware how this is limiting. There are lots of ambiguities with data sheet because, and you see that only when you make a model. When you make a model, then you start to see all those edge cases, which are not actually properly described. And I think this is a little bit the idea here to make it possible for companies to release not only a data sheet, but a behavioral model for the embedded systems that they are developing, that they are selling. And now a company may release, it's open source. So, you know, a company may just want to release it as a model on their own web page or whatever. But I think there will also be companies that will want to release this only to their clients or for a fee, you know, a little bit like the stores nowadays, Play Stores, App Store work that you can have on the one hand free things and everybody can contribute. On the other hand, you may have items that are sold commercially. That's a little bit the ecosystem that we want to create, give the possibility to create things for free, distribute it for free but also for companies to use it with no strings attached, including for commercial development. And then, okay. yeah, another aspect of the business is going to, is developing software that is enterprise software. So things that will allow you to convert, say, models between, say, asynchronics to another standards, because, you know, those industries have uh, various standards, like, Automotive industry has a standard for how you make models. It's a standard based on a C interface, C API, and XML. And it tells you basically what are the inputs of this model, what are the outputs, plus some metadata that are associated to this, like the units and things like that. This is called FMI. So this is one a standard that is pretty well known. You have other standards. So in the aerospace industry, for instance, the European Space Agency has a Standard for model exchange, it's called SMP. It's a bigger beast, describes not only the models themselves, but how you orchestrate the whole simulation. So they, there's probably a need as well for those companies to have a possibility to easily exchange models from asynchronics to those, vice versa. You know, generate model skeletons from a database, because this is also another thing. These industries are moving to a system where everything is based on a model. So you describe at the beginning of the project, you describe the interface and thing of your system as a model, and you try to generate the next steps, implement a more refined model, and then implement your hardware based on those specifications which grow with time. And I think this integrates very well into this way of developing modern systems. Okay. It's quite a big vision. So that your business yeah. plan must be pretty well <laughs> thought out. Yeah, we'll see. I think that the time is ripe for this. I think what is missing at the moment is, you know, you have lots of software packages like obviously MATLAB, you have others like ANSYS and so on. All of these, they have actually what I think two problems. I mean, one, they cost a lot of money and you cannot build an open ecosystem around those. I mean, distributing a model in MATLAB is asking, giving your client a model in MATLAB is basically telling your client or in Simulink is telling your client, well, now you must, I give you that for free. Now you just need to pay a few thousand euros or a few tens of thousand for MATLAB, Simulink, and everything you may need on top of this. So it really doesn't, it makes it difficult to develop such, such an ecosystem. That's one thing. The other thing is that I believe, I mean, obviously I'm realistic here. Asynchronics is in no position to replace today MATLAB. It doesn't really intend to, but I think what it does well is focusing on the cyber physical systems. So it's different in, from MATLAB in the sense that it's event driven. It's called a discrete event simulator. This have always existed. But for instance, in the spacecraft industry, it's based, all based around discrete event simulator. And sometimes you will need a MATLAB model because, well, that's more convenient. They can solve equations in a much more friendly way and so on than you would do with it. But you can import this. You can make an export of that model into a discrete event simulator. This is totally possible. But the fact is, when you simulate a modern system, most of what you will model is not, you know, a spring, 
an amortizer or whatever, you will actually model digital systems which have complex state machines. And for this, Rust is fantastic because of, you know, algebraic data types. It becomes very easy to express the different states of those systems. It maps much better to the modelization of modeling of a digital system. So I see a big potential here as well. Okay. Uh, that's a pretty good vision. And since you have that background, I mean, you definitely understand it pretty well. So that's good. We are running a little bit out of time. I guess now would be the time that you can plug people how to get in touch or how to check out the project and also how to get in touch with you in case you're interested to know some more. Oh, yeah. So that's uh, plug time. Okay. Yes, I will use this. <laughs> I like you're prepared for plug time now. <laughs> no. So yeah, the main GitHub project is Asynchronics and I think people will probably not have too many problems to find that. It's IX in the end. Um, there's also a website. This website is a bit bare-bone, and this is about the more business aspects. That is called Asynchronics.com, and it's ICS in the end. But again, this is a bit of a bare-bone site. We will probably expand this at some point. Anyway, at the moment, I'm very much welcoming people on the GitHub repo finding issues or feature requests because I'm coming from a specific perspective and I think that uh, definitely Asynchronix could be used for uh, other use cases that I did not even think about or that I know not well enough to uh, cover well. So yes, I'm really welcoming here ideas and obviously bug reports that will happen, I'm sure. Awesome. Well, thank you for coming on and talking about Asynchronox. Asynchronox, I believe that's how you say it. The names is, you know, it's confusing me because they're so similar, but obviously that's intentional, right? Asynchronix is the name of the company. Yeah, Asynchronox is. is the name of the product or this. this uh, no, both are Asynchronix. Yeah, I mean, oh. Oh, oh yeah, that's are. right. Oh, my goodness. I don't know. Uh, let's stop talking about it. I'm well, technically messing it up. <laughs> it's a question of perspective and taste, I guess, how you pronounce it. Anyway. Thank you very much for having me on this podcast. Yes, I appreciate it. Thank you for coming on. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.